Hello and welcome to Griffin Art. Now in this video I'm going to be showing you a DIY project which is quite unusual for this channel but when I decided that I wanted to achieve this faux effect for my floor I couldn't find any guidance anywhere online so I decided on that basis that the process that I went through was probably worth sharing with you. Now the only problem with it being a DIY project is that I wasn't really able to provide a clear picture of what that floor is really like on that little YouTube thumbnail. So the first thing that I want to do is to show you some video clips of that floor so that you are in a better position to decide whether this is the effect that you're looking for for yourself and therefore whether this video is worth watching. So let's get that out of the way first. Right, so I'm now upstairs because actually it's the landing floor that I've painted. And incidentally, you might note that the walls have not yet been painted. There. And I would say at this point that if you're going to do a floor, it's best to do that before you do the walls because as careful as you are, you are likely to splash your walls. Right, so I'm now just going to walk along the landing so that you can get a view of that floor and have a look to see how that's going. So I'm just showing you a little bit of more close up of the design there, you can see the border there. And then if I just move out onto the landing itself, hopefully you can get a view of how that's looking along the length of the landing. So I'm just gonna walk you down. And then if I turn the corner here, you can see that I've left the border open at the top of the stairs. Now that was my choice. But obviously you can use your own imagination, do whatever design you wish. If you indeed want to add a border, it's not absolutely necessary to be honest. So I just back up into another bedroom, then you can have an, another view of that floor from here. So hopefully that will give you a clearer idea and we can now get on to the process of what's involved. Okay, so before we start, and I know it's boring, but I've got to talk to you about preparation. If you want to have a nice smooth floor at the end of your project, you are going to have to start with a nice smooth floor before you begin to paint. Now, I can't really tell you what sort of preparation work that's going to involve because it will depend on the floor that you're starting out with. What I can say is if you've got any nails in evidence, you want to get a nail punch, punch them home and fill the hole above them. Make sure that any screws that are in the floor are screwed below the surface of the floor and again fill on top of that screw. If you've got any joins in any boards that leave a gap you need to make sure that those are filled in a way that they won't crack open again. So it's all of that sort of thing that you need to pay attention to before you start and if you feel it's necessary you know it may be that you need to put a thin leveling compound on the whole of your floor. So once you've reached the stage where you've got a nice smooth surface to work with, now we can get down and start to paint. Right, so I'm just going to be using water-based emulsion paints that I've already got in stock. Now my gut tells me that you just want to be avoiding any satin or silk paints, anything that has a sheen. You need something that later staining will sort of soak into the paint layer, which wouldn't necessarily happen with a sheen. So I'm just using a Dulux uh, Jasmine White and it's a matte paint for walls and ceilings so that might give you a, a, a guidance there. Now the only other thing to bear in mind is that you want to start as light as possible and then add the darker layers as you layer up. So you could start with a brilliant white paint, I'm actually starting here, the colour is Jasmine White so that's my base layer. Now how you apply that paint, again, is up to you. My instinct has been to use a roller simply because I want to minimize any brush strokes. I want to keep that smooth layer smooth. Now in case you didn't know, my understanding with rollers is that if you've got a, a roller such as this one, which is, has got a smooth surface to it, that works well with a smooth surface. You only really need the fluffy rollers 
if your surface is not smooth. Now the only other thing I need to say is that for your very first application of paint, depending on how thick your paint is and how hot the area that you're working in is, it is likely for that very first application you're going to want to thin your paint down. This will help to provide a very good key with the floor surface and it will also help to make sure that your surface remains smooth. Okay, so I'm now going to go and open my tin of paint and sort that out and then I'll come back to you. Okay, so I just wanted to show you my paint. This is before I've thinned it. So this is the thickness that I've got. And if I turn over on the back of my spoon, I hope you can see how that little ridge there is not flattening out very quickly. And so that's an indication to me for my very first coat of paint, that's too thick. It needs to settle more quickly than that. So that perhaps will give you an indication of how thin your first coat needs to be. Now the other thing that you can do to help with that moisture layer is to simply have a spray bottle of water and this, this is something that I will do with this sheet of MDF which is going to form my sample floorboard. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I shall thin a portion of that paint to a consistency that I'm happy with and then I'm going to spray uh, water onto this sheet of MDF so that when the paint's applied the MDF won't just draw all the moisture out of the paint and make it dry very quickly. So I'll get on with that off camera and at that point I'll come back to you. Okay, so I've thinned a portion of paint in this old jug here and I hope that you can see that that's much thinner. If I turn that onto the back of my spoon, you'll be able to see that that is laying down a lot more quickly. It's not covering the back of the spoon as much either. So, you know, that'll give you an idea of how thin you want to have your paint in the first instance. Now, I don't know whether you'll be able to see, but I have also sprayed this MDF with water. It is actually still damp. It's not covered in water, but it, it's it's damp to the touch. Now I'm sure because most of you will be creative you're going to know exactly where to go from here but I may as well just show you this first coat of paint. I'm just going to put a little bit of um, paint on the board to start off with and I can start my roller off with that to see how it goes. And you can probably get an idea there but it is a very thin watery coat of, of paint that's going down and it's it's going to keep that nice smooth surface you know that you've gone to some extent I hope to achieve in your preparation stage so I'll just continue and do that off camera and then I'll, I'll continue to build up those layers until such time as I've got a nice even coating and it's a good solid color so I there's no point in me doing all of that on camera and wasting your time so I will get it to that stage off camera and then I'll come back to you Okay, so I've actually only just finished applying the first coat of paint and you can see it's very patchy and it's still drying. But I suddenly remember that there was um, a tip that I wanted to give you regarding your roller. Now, you know, rollers are something, you, you they're a paint to clean. And in order for you to be using this the following day without cleaning it, all you need to do, if you didn't already know, is you can wrap your roller in a piece of cling film. So it's just something like this. This is just Sainsbury's Basics. So cling film from your supermarket. I've got a square here. So all you need to do is damp down your roller and then place it into your cling film and thoroughly wrap it. As long as you've moistened it down enough, you know, do spray it with plenty of water and then thoroughly wrap it in that cling film nice and tightly. I'll just show you how I do that just wrap it all around that end and when you're when you are dampening down your roller make sure you dampen this area here on the roller because that's the bit that tends to dry out and you don't want to have little lumps coming off on the following day but if you do that and you've moistened it down well enough it's a water-based paint you're not going to have any problems with it just set it to one side overnight you can unwrap that in the morning and it'll be ready to go so you don't have to keep cleaning your rollers so i'm hoping that that will be of help to you and now i will do as i said before i'll get my um, mdf floorboard sample to a stage where it's got a good layer of the paint color and then i'll come back to you so having applied a few coats of paint i now have a solid coat of jasmine white 
So having got your floor to this stage, this is your last chance to check that that floor surface is still smooth. So if there's any little bits that have been left over by the roller, something like that, then this is the time to sand them out. So assuming everything's fine and dandy, we're now ready to put on our next layer of color. Now I've chosen to be quite subtle in the color differences. So I'm just going again with a matte emulsion but I'm going for an orchid white. As you can see, it's existing stock. It's what I've used in some of my rooms already. So it's only very slightly creamier than the jasmine white that I've already used. Now there is only going to be one application of this particular paint, and I'm going to use a sort of rag method. So I've taken a paper towel that's actually quite lint free. This is quite a strong towel. So you might prefer to use a bit of a lint cloth or something like that. And I'm, I've made that thoroughly wet. I've just taken a quarter of that towel, actually, made it thoroughly wet. And I'm going to produce something that's a bit scrunchy that I can put into the paint and then just dab onto the surface of the board. Now, I am a little bit away from the board in order to gain access to the mic on the camera, but I will try and just demonstrate a little bit so that you can see what's going on. I've sort of loaded up that cloth with some paint. I hope you can see that all right there. And all I'm going to do is dab at random. Now, I do want it to not exactly cover all of that white. I need to have some areas of white remaining. And again, I'm trying to keep those layers smooth. And you can probably see that there is a difference in shade there. So I'll just build that up off camera and then I'll come back to you and you can see what the finished result is like. Right, so now that layer has dried, that difference really is very, very subtle and I am hoping that you can make it out. I've lowered the camera just to try and help you with that. But just in case you can't see, what you're actually aiming for is about a 50% coverage of that second layer. So you've still got 50% of that white showing through. And it's just a random application. So I'm hoping that that will help you understand what you're aiming for. Right, so at this point, life begins to get very interesting. The next few layers that we apply to our floor is actually aimed at staining the floor in layers to build up depth. And to start with, we're actually going to be using just normal black filtered coffee. So when I made my cup of coffee earlier today, I just saved a little bit extra from that. And this is just, as I say, black coffee, no sugar or milk or anything added, obviously. And that's what we're going to be using for our next layer. And to apply it, I've just opted to use a pipette. If you don't have a pipette, you could probably just load the liquid onto a paintbrush and flick it that way. That may serve the same purpose. So all I'm going to do is load some coffee into the pipette. It's going to be a bit difficult to demonstrate, so bear with me. And I'm just going to splash it on to the floor area. Now with the very first layer of application, you do want to make, you can spread it about a little bit, you do want to make these um, pools quite large because the next ones that you apply will overlap and start to create a depth. You can see I've over splashed there. So that's all you're doing just splashing on that coffee. So I am going to finish that off off camera and then I'll come back to you. Okay, so here we have our first layer of coffee staining thoroughly dried. And as you can see here, coffee has a tendency to dry gray rather than brown, which is good to know. Now it's not actually the color of the coffee that is so important. It's more the fact that as it dries, it actually creates this darker outline of color that forms that outline of the shape of the original puddle of coffee. Now, as we add further layers of coffee, it's that outline that's going to give our project depth and definition. Now, the only thing to bear in mind is that in order to achieve that maximum definition, it is absolutely necessary 
for every single layer of coffee application to thoroughly dry out. If you apply wet coffee to a previous layer of coffee that isn't totally dry, what will tend to happen is that the, the two layers merge together to some extent and then you either lose in entirety or to some extent that outline that's so important to us. So I know it's frustrating, you know, we just want to get on with our projects, but patience is the name of the game in this instance. Don't be too hasty, just give your project time, let it dry out. If in doubt, give it a little bit longer. Now I will be applying several layers of coffee to this project and I don't really think it's going to help you to see every single layer. However, I will show you uh, the second layer. So the next thing that I'll do is just apply the second layer and whilst that's still wet, I'll come straight back to you so that you can have a look to see how the process is built. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can spot the difference here. So we've got those large puddles of grey coffee, that was our first layer and as I said at the time, we only do that for the very first layer. The, the subsequent layers, and all of them will continue in this vein, you've just got much smaller droplets of coffee going down. So this just needs to thoroughly dry again, so I will come back to you at that stage. So this is our second layer of coffee now thoroughly dry and I did just want to show you the project at this stage so that you can see what I meant in terms of how these little outlines of those further droplets are now, there's, some of them are occurring inside the original puddle of coffee, some are overlapping and all of that is starting to give this effect depth. So I just wanted you to be able to see that uh, so that you gained a greater understanding of what I was trying to tell you. Now there's not enough coffee layers down here for my liking so I will be uh, applying some further layers off camera and once I've got the coverage that I want and it's thoroughly dry then I can come back to you and we can start moving on to the next staining process. Okay, now for my taste, I have actually finished with the coffee and I did actually end up putting down five separate layers. That does mean that we can now move on to the second stain, which is actually, in this instance, tea. Just plain tea from a tea bag. Now, I'm sure it doesn't make any difference whatsoever, but in case you're interested, I'm actually using Twining's English breakfast tea. It's just in tea bags. Now the application process is much the same as it was for the layers of coffee, but on a personal level, I'm not going to be putting down any large areas of tea. Now I think you've got the gist of the process, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to splash on the layers of tea off camera and then I'll come back and show you the finished result once everything's dried. Right, so that's the T layer also completed. So just to help you out, whilst you have a look at it, I will go through how I went about achieving this layer. So first of all, if you can have a look through the pattern and you can spot all these little tiny pinky brown dots that are around, that was actually my first layer. So the actual aim of that initial layer was to very lightly speckle the whole of that surface. So once that layer was dry I then sort of took a step back and had a look at the overall pattern and decided where I wanted to place a more consolidated amount of that tea colour in random places. So looking at what's in front of you here you can probably see there's a consolidated area here where there's a lot more tea being applied and the same is happening here. Now if I move the board just to one side, you'll be able to see again, hopefully, where I've also repeated that sort of process in a couple of other places. So you can see more tea colour here and more tea colour there. Now this, this is an artistic sort of licence process, there's no rights or wrongs. It's just about you deciding where that extra colour is going to look right for you. Okay, having achieved that layer, we're now ready to get on to the third layer of colour. Now for that final layer of colour, I'm actually going to be using a water-based acrylic. 
It's a Windsor and Newton product, as you can probably see here, and it's actually raw sienna opaque, which is a sort of tan color. Now, whilst you can get similar tubes of paint that are actually watercolor paints, I would say avoid those. Acrylic is fine because although it's a water-based paint, it does have some resistance to water when it's cured. Watercolor does not. And the trouble with that is when you put down your varnish layer, if that is also water-based, it will smear that watercolor. So acrylic's fine, avoid the watercolors. Now I have mixed some up already and I just want to show you the consistency of that. You're really looking for something that's probably not far off the consistency of the tea and coffee that you applied earlier, all right? So that's what I shall be working with. So once again, I will apply that color offline in the same way with the little pipette and then I will come back to you when that's dry so that you can see what you're actually aiming for with this particular color layer. Okay, so I've now applied that final layer of raw sienna and that really is just about providing little spots of stronger color within the mix just here and there. So overall, for most of this area, there is no raw sienna. It's just in little spots, and I'm going to point those out to you to give you an idea of what you're aiming for. So I'm not sure whether you'll be able to distinguish that slightly deeper color, but actually up here in this corner, there's just some speckles within that corner. And also again here, there's just a few speckles along just that stretch there. If we move over here, We've got another stretch of speckles just in this region here. Now, once again, if I just move this board along so that you can see the full amount of this stretch here, then hopefully you'll also be able to see that there are some speckles of that raw sienna in here, and there's a few down here. And there's also just a few, you may not be able to see actually, just a few here in this very top corner and those areas that I've just gone through with you are the only areas where that raw sienna has been applied. So that's basically our faux finish now complete but before I move on one thing I did think might help you is if you want some really really tiny speckles then this is the way that I have found to go about that. So you want to take your pipette and have hardly anything in it at all. And then all you simply do is you tap it on the edge of a finger and you'll find that the speckles, the little speckles that come out are very, very tiny. I hope you can see that. But that's at least that's a method that you can practice yourself if you're struggling to get those smaller speckles. Okay, so now you've completed your effect what do you do next? Now, whether or not you intend to apply a border to your floor or any other kind of embellishment, before you do that, you want to protect this faux effect that you've worked so hard to achieve. Now, initially, if it's at all possible and it's not gonna cause you any problems, I would say leave your floor alone overnight, 12 hours at least, just so that everything thoroughly dries out and those stains really cure and become fast within the floor. Now, at that stage, you can then look at applying some kind of protection and that will really be down to what you're used to using and what you're comfortable with. So I'm not actually going to apply any protection on camera because I feel that's a bit of a waste of your time. Now I can tell you what I've used and that is a Ron Seal interior varnish. Now you do want a clear varnish um, and this one is, as you can see here, it's got a, it's a quick drying finish with diamond hard protection and it's a satin clear. Now, I normally would opt for a matte, but when I went into the store, they didn't have any, so I've, I've had to choose the satin. It's not a problem. It still gives it a good layer of protection. Now, if you are intending to put a border on top of your floor surface, then initially you want to apply two to three coats of varnish before you look to put that border in place. Now, this is not just because the minute you're standing on your finish 
and and working on it you could damage it it's also because if you're going to put a straight edge border on you're you're going to need to apply masking tape now the level of tack on the masking tapes that will provide you with a straight edge can sometimes be aggressive so that means that when you peel them back up off the surface they may take some particles of the underlying surface with them now if that happens to be varnish you can easily repair that but if it's taking off a surface layer that is your part of your faux finish that is going to be far less easy to repair so that's why you put two or three coats of varnish on then put your masking tape down now whilst we're on the subject of masking tape just in case there are any of you who are not really familiar with using it i'll just give you a few pointers now this is a fairly common masking tape you know it's often found in diy stores and things but it isn't um advisable to use it in my view it is a cheap masking tape it's quite thin and it does tend to leak around the edges and you don't get a really crisp clean line and you you're probably going to want that if you want to set up some straight edge borders now this tape on the other hand which has got a sort of backing on it is a very good quality tape you, I don't know whether you can see it's going to provide a really clean edge to anything that you mask off however this does relate to the automotive industry I did use it for my own floor but the adhesion on the back is slightly aggressive and in places it did lift off um, at the underlying layers of varnish so if I was doing this job again, I would definitely try and get hold of a good quality painters and decorators masking tape. That sort of tape is designed to go on top of emulsion on walls and to be peeled off without damaging that paint layer. So I think um, that's probably the best kind of masking tape for you to go for when you're setting up for your borders. Now, with regard to those borders that you saw at the very early stages of this video, I actually masked off tram lines with masking tape. And the paint that I used was the Windsor & Newton acrylic paint that we used in the speckling process here, just different shades of it. I just didn't thin it to the same extent. So just keep the mix thick without it being really lumpy so that you're going to get brush strokes. So it's about that balance. You may need more than one coat around those tram lines to create the border. And then you can peel back your masking tape and you should have a nice clean edge to your borderline. Then you can set up separate borders if you want them according to your own design. So finally, really, once you've completed your borders, so your floor is completely finished, at that point you need to apply at least another two coats of varnish to protect that floor. You know, if in doubt, add another coat of varnish. I believe upstairs, I'm right in saying that I put five coats of varnish down in total. So two coats before my borders and then another three. So that will give you some guideline and at that stage you've got a pretty hard wearing floor. I've been painting walls up on that landing and I've used step ladders on that floor and it hasn't made a mark. So hopefully if you follow that sort of method you will have the same sort of surface. Well, I think that's actually, as far as I can take things, I think that's all the information that I can give you to enable you to have your own successful faux floor project. Now, just in case you're interested, I will just put this sample board on the floor so that um, you can have a view of it in its entirety because obviously you haven't been able to see the whole thing here where I'm working it on the video. So I'll just get that set up and then I'll come back to you. Okay, so I've just laid that on the floor and I'll just move in a little closer so that you can get an idea of the whole board. So that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching and hopefully you'll join me again at a future date.